A lot of uh, fixing of pipes was happening. Um, a lot of people started really saying they, they know, they're going to stop paying their rates. Also, there is no master plan for water supply in the city. The, the only shift that would give us the change that we need for stable governance and, and to stabilize the city would be an election. Pace Car Rental is one of the fastest growing car rental businesses in South Africa with branches all over the country. They've got branches in Santon, Kempton Park, Pretoria, Mshlanga, Kabecha, wherever you are, Pace Car Rental is there as well. A bold podcast like the State of the Nation needs a bold partner. And we have found that partner in Pace Car Rental. So why don't you support them? Nothing proves state failure more than seeing water tankers driving through the streets of the flagship city of the country. Uh, for the last hundred years, Johannesburg has been the business center of South Africa. It was originally the center of mining and then became the center of industry and progress in South Africa. Uh, one of the first cities to be electrified, one of the first cities to be um, to have piped water through a very intricate system of uh, water uh, sourced quite away from the city in the Vaal River, piped all the way up to Johannesburg, purified, and for many years one of the great claims of Johannesburg was the great quality of the water in, in Johannesburg. Well, recently, in addition to the city going uh, dark because of uh, load shedding, we uh, suddenly discovered that we are also prone to a new thing in Johannesburg called watershedding, something that we've seen only in rural areas up until now. The question has got to be asked, what is going on? Everybody is quiet. We know that Johannesburg is run through an intricate system of uh, coalitions between the ANC, the EFF and the Patriotic Alliance. And the city is headed by a puppet mayor from uh, the small Al Jamar party who then blames any inquiry on racism and people not wanting a black leader to succeed. So we thought it'd be a good idea to hear from somebody that does know the city, and that is the former mayor, Mpo Palazzi. Welcome uh, to the State of the Nation. Welcome back. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's been a while. It has been a while. And uh, before we catch up with on the city, you have you have left formal politics. I'm going to say for now, but you are out of politics. You're yes. back. You're back practicing medicine. That's right. Uh, but uh, as somebody who just a year ago, I suppose, eh, was the mayor of the city, you would have some insights. And seeing as though we can't get any comments from Maya Quabello Guamanda or uh, Kenny Kunene or any other of the people running the city at the moment, never mind uh, your friend, Mr. Floyd Brink, who's the city manager, we thought I'd you know, we'd just invite you along just to get your assessment of the city of Johannesburg. What is going on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been out of the city, so I left at the end of September. Um, it's now six months since I've been out of the city. I've gone back to medical practice, uh, but I remain a resident of the city. Yes. So I know when residents say there's no water, it affects me as well. Um, I have a Jojo tank where I live, and I've used it more often than I would like to in recent months because of all these challenges. Um, I do also know where we were as a city in terms of water supply in general. And I would be lying if I said that the water supply challenge in the city is a new thing. It has certainly worsened. And I believe that it's a function of poor leadership capacity to actually see the plans through that were in place to start to resolve some of the challenges. So I don't know if you want me to go into... I certainly do. Right. So... So we're all aware that the city of Joburg has an infrastructure backlog that's historical, that has to do with the 30 years of democracy and how things were done in the city. Um, there was a lack of maintenance of existing infrastructure. Our infrastructure just worsened and worsened and worsened. And we've got huge infrastructure challenges um, with regards to water supply. 
amongst other things. But we focus on water for now. Um, we found that a lot of our pipes are old. A lot of our pipes are leaking. So there's a lot of water losses in the city. Um, very high percentages, up to about 60%. Sometimes we, we lose a lot of our water. That's one problem. Also, there is no master plan for water supply in the city. At least at the time I left, um, we had started engaging Job of Water and they had said to us, I believe that it was around 25 billion that they needed just to address their infrastructure backlog in Job of Water alone. We didn't have that money in the Fiskars, and so we were starting to look at how we could meet that um, that need. And one of the things, of course, would be investment attraction, we would be finding um, partners. We had started on those road trips. Um, I had traveled to Cairo, to, to Italy, um, to Paris, um, I, beg, I beg your pardon, to look at solutions for our water losses, but also to look at solutions going forward um, and, and potential investment partners that could come in and help us resolve some of our issues. So that work was underway. But um, over and above that, there are co-dependencies between local government and national government, and, and to some extent also provincial government when it comes to water supply. So the city buys bulk water from Rand Water. So there's also that. So whenever Rand Water has its own challenges, the city will be affected. Um, there isn't always transparency as to what the challenges are on the Rand Water side, and we often have to chase and chase and chase uh, before getting answers. But even when I was mayor, we did have some instances where we had challenges on the Rand Water side. And when you have challenges on the supply side, you can't you can't um, you also can't supply to your customers if i can just come in there uh, i'm no plumber uh, and i'm very curious as to what any political delegation has to gain from an international trip to an exotic destination to find out what to do about leaking pipes Okay. Right. One would imagine a pipe leaks and you fix it. It's, that's hardly, they, you know, that's sort of something you learn when you're five years old, right? Um, I wouldn't imagine, otherwise, surely one's just really having an expensive holiday and then you're going to come back and fix the leaking pipe, no? Yeah. Well, um, I hear you. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Uh, there's a lot of research and development at a global level to, to fix resolve. pipes to resolve a lot of issues. Yeah, water losses are not are not unique to Johannesburg. No, sure. Yeah, they're a but global... the solution surely is not that difficult to find, one would imagine. There uh... are there are very innovative solutions um, that our officials, I mean, we, we took the MD for Wajobok Water as an example, the MMC for EISD was there as well, and some of the things they were learning for the first time. So there would be solutions that we're already aware of, but there would be technologies that we're not exposed to as yet. And study tours are healthy if you're leading a city like Johannesburg, because you're on the cutting edge of technologies and you're able to move with the times, but you're also able to work more efficiently when you don't have um, uh, resources at your disposal, you really want to work smart. And the more information you have at your disposal, the better. So yes, I'm pro study tours. I'll always have study tours where necessary. I mean, even when I was MMC Health, before we rolled out substance abuse treatment centers in the city, we went and looked at what's happening in other parts of the country. And, and we also went on, on, a study, on an international study tour to look at developments outside, to look at where we were legislatively in, Johan, in South Africa and where the legal gaps were to help us to combat substance abuse more effectively. So I'm always pro study tours. Um, out of them, you're able to then implement solutions that actually work and, and that are current. So yes, we had plans out of that. Um, it's unfortunate we could not see them through. Okay, so do, so uh, study tours are a good idea. Uh, did you learn about non-leaking pipes that's on your study just, tour? Look, that's just one of yes. the things. Yeah, uh, water losses are more complex than just leaking pipes. Um, it's got to also do with how you diagnose the leaks. In certain areas, it's almost impossible. Um, it's very easy in rate paying areas. You've got non rate paying areas. There's so many things to consider. I mean, I don't know if you know what's happening in Soweto, for instance, where a lot of people aren't paying um, for water. So there's no incentive to even switch off when there's a leaking pipe. How do you then 
monitor and track what's happening, where your losses are, and how do you then resolve that? So there are a lot of technologies, um, a lot of solutions. And yes, we, we were quite excited to see what's available. And, and it's important as a city to have a master plan. How mm. are you going to deal with your water supply challenges? And to have a, a plan that's actually going to work, you need to have information at your disposal. And we were well on our way. And that's why I'm saying we were even at a point of quantifying exactly what it would take for us to get Johannesburg water secure. And unfortunately, we didn't have the money. And there were further um, investment attraction initiatives that were planned. Um, we had planned in the year that we were asked at 2023, I think we were looking at around April, May, we were going to have an, a big investment attraction drive in the city. We were going to have an event. We were working with one of the, the global institutions that was helping us. They, they do that with a lot of cities around the world um, to identify potential investors that could come and help us with Joburg's infrastructure backlog. The backlog in Johannesburg is just too big um, for any, even a term of office would not be sufficient to address it. Okay, so um, help help me unpack this uh, because one would imagine you've got a massive backlog because back in the, the first 20 years of democracy, zero uh, maintenance gets done. Uh, all the money goes into somebody's uh, bank account. No real maintenance is done. The few leaking pipes get fixed. Uh, then suddenly we forget how to fix the leaking pipes. I've actually got an international tour. I'm just being sarcastic, but let's just say the pipes, we learn how to fix the pipes. But now this backlog starts building up. But in the meantime, there is some budget, right? Right. So There remains not sufficient budget, but some budget. Okay. So, so on the one hand, you need to maintain existing infrastructure. On the other hand, you need to invest, right, in new infrastructure. So in other words, you need to invest in reservoirs, as an example. So... Um, and again, I, I, I need to correct this. It's not that we don't know how to fix leaking pipes. Mm. A lot of uh, fixing of pipes was happening from 2016 when we were first mm. in government. But like I said, it's a lot more complex than that. And, and there are more innovative solutions. And yes, we want to be on the cutting edge of technologies. We, there's no need for us to be in the dark, mm. you know, just because we're in Africa. We need to know what's the best way to approach solutions and, and, and we need to be able to resolve issues. Um, so the money that was allocated to Joburg Water, I mean, in our, in our term of office, we increased the allocation towards Joburg Water because of the challenges that we faced. It was nowhere near enough. I mean, I think our budget was somewhere around $800 million. Uh, We're talking about a $25 billion backlog. Mm. You know, it's incomparable that you would think that even in one term of office, you'd be able to address those issues. And that's why you would need some creativity. And there's a number of things. I mean, the, your solution would need to be multi-pronged. So one, you'd need to look at your finances. Um, how do you increase your finances so that you can increase your investment towards new infrastructure uh, as well as maintenance, right? How do you do that? We identified a number of things. One was unfunded mandates. So there were a lot of those in the city. And I spoke a lot about it as mayor, where the city had over the years taken on functions that were actually not local government competency. And over the years, it had become so normal that residents also demand those services from the city and the city kept giving and giving and giving. And so that money that's, that's going to the, 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 the core mandate holder and not coming to the cities, in fact, diverted away from where it should actually be be utilized. And what happens is the city then takes from, from what's supposed to be going to its core functions, such as water supply, and gives to, a, a good example is community development, sports, recreation, the arts, the amount of investment in the city towards those things. Are they necessary? Of course, people need them. But there's money at a national level, at a provincial level, that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. The real work is happening at a local level, and the money is simply not coming to local government. We had started having those discussions with National Treasury, and we had gone on a research initiative in the city to look at identify all our unfunded mandates so that we could go with um, um, an, an approach to national treasury that says help us approach the core mandate holders to either devolve or take over that way you free up the money in the city that's supposed to be going to basic services so that's just one of the many solutions to the problem two you increase your revenue collection now revenue collection had dwindled 
um, for obvious reasons, we had semigration, a lot of people leaving to the city of Cape Town as an example. We also had emigration. You will notice the property market in Johannesburg is booming because people are leaving their properties. Even before selling property, people leave simply because they find the situation is untenable and they can't wait to leave. And so with that, then your, your rate payer base also shrinks and that affects your revenue and that impacts on your ability to then resolve the problems on the ground. And, and, and that is something we've also trying to resolve. One, by involving residents, holding yourself accountable. The fact that um, um, you are in public office, you need to be able to tell residents what's going on. I worry when I hear you say you can't get answers from people who are in office. How are you supposed to inspire confidence in a Joburg resident that they should stick around? You're working on solutions. So, so one, we, we were transparent. You'll be aware. We were always in the media. We were sharing what's going on, and we were sharing solutions. That's just one of the things. But also, you need to retain your, your rate payer base by increasingly working on solutions across the board. You know, we had the energy in Daba to work on energy solutions because we realized with load shedding, we were losing people to Cape Town because Cape Town could provide some kind of protection and it had to do with how the network in Cape Town is configured and so on. And so, yes, we, we were able to, to, to work towards that. And I'm sure you, you followed developments no. in, in, in the energy space. So you, you work on all the challenges so you can retain your rate payer base and that's how you're going to grow your revenue and that's how you're going to resolve issues. You build with the people in Johannesburg. That's one of the things you need to do. So you remember we had Operation Buyam Teto, we were cutting off where, when, where there was non-payment, where there was affordability, we were going after even government departments that were on payment holidays indefinitely. And we were saying we sh we, we cutting off, we threatened to cut off even hospitals um, that were owing because the Gauteng Department of Health was owing so much money. So we had to do all those kinds of initiatives. So you need to increase um, your, your funding base so that you can give a little bit more to entities like Joba Quarter so they can start to deal more decisive. But, but look, the gap is too big. Mm. Um, even with that, you still need strategic partners. And that's why the investment drive, investment attraction drive, you would need to look at PPPs, um, uh, public private partnerships. Um, the city has an office that deals with those and, and they had a pipeline of projects that were looking at um, sewer and, and water more specifically because, yes, you would need partners to be able to achieve what we need to achieve. Okay, so let's roll forward. Um, your coalition was, uh, was displaced by another coalition of the ANC, the EFF, and the Patriotic Alliance that are now in in charge. And since then, um, we've just seen some of the most horrendous failures. We've seen streets exploding. We've seen people getting burnt to death in a building owned by the city. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, we've got failures of the electricity grid and now failures of the water grid. Uh, what is happening? Are you in a position to comment as to how come we have these multiple failures all, all at once? Is it just bad luck? Is it just victimizing a black mayor, as Guamanda likes to say? Or is it just... Is there another reason? Is you know, in in your opinion, you're out of the game. Uh, I know that there's there's certain legal constraints on what you can and can't say. Uh, you had your problems with the city mayor, who uh, we must say, if, if people don't know, he was uh, Julius Malema's business partner in On Point Engineering, and now he's the city manager of Johannesburg. Uh, in your opinion, as a citizen of Johannesburg. Why do suddenly all of these multiple failures visit us all at once? Well, there's a number of issues. Um, and yes, uh, some we can't explain away. For instance, some things are just an act of God, right? However, there's a, I can't see a, any of those, a glaring... I can't see any, sorry, any of those that I've raised being an act of God. The one is, uh, you know, the, 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 the street exploding speaks to bad management the city the building being hijacked and then burning a light speaks to multiple failures 
right? The electricity grid falling over every five minutes, the water crisis, as we've discussed, none of them are act of God. There's been flooding, there's climate change, so there will be those things yeah, no, that are we're not talking about a flood. Yeah, so just as a whole, there's yeah. just been a lot of disasters in the city. Yeah, but they're man made. Especially. That's what I'm there are, there are, the majority, there are, there are failures the majority, of management. the majority. Now I will address the man-made ones. Yes. But I, but I, I, I don't want to be unfair and say the flooding was caused by this coalition. What's flooding? You know, we've had. Um, I don't know if you've been okay. following. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, right. The, the, we, yeah. Right. We have had. Every year, one car gets taken we've, off the bridge. Had. Right. We get it. Right. In terms of how that's managed, yes. then we can talk to leadership capacity challenges. And you remember we had floods when I was mayor. Yeah. And it's it's important that I play fair because I cannot such an act like things did not go wrong when we mm. were in office. Um, as And as much as we had a plan, some plans take time to roll out. But there is comfort in knowing that there is leadership capacity and that there is a plan and that the plan is unfolding. And for me, that's what's missing now. Um, I cannot sit here and say in the last 14 months since we were ousted, uh, we would have set up a competent disaster management center, which we were planning to do and we were well on our way to doing that. I don't know if, if, if it would have been fully functional by now because of just how the cycle of things in local government and so on. But at least we knew we had a plan, we knew what needed to happen, and we were working on it. So there is a glaring leadership gap. And when Mayor Guamanda was elected, or when the coalition decided he was going to be their mayoral candidate, and they had the numbers on their side, and they were able to elect him, I knew we could not expect much from city leadership at that point. Um, it's very easy to to decide whether you you should manage your expectations or whether you should be hopeful. This is somebody with a great ten. It has been established. Um, they have zero management capacity, zero experience, um, real experience to run a competent um, institution like the city of Johannesburg. So let's talk money and and what citizens or residents of of the city of Johannesburg could do. What are their options? Because, you know, there, there is no business in the world that can um, deduct money and then not provide the service. We've got all sorts of consumer protection acts that, that deal with it. I can't sell you a microphone and then not deliver it, right? You can, you've got recourse. So we understand local government is where the rubber hits the road and it seems to me that Joburg is traveling about one year behind uh, Durban. In the failures we're seeing in the Etiquini um, um, metro, it look like they're about a year ahead of the failures that we have here. And, and we're having all sorts of uh, maneuvers around rate boycotts. Now, I've had Wayne Divinage here from Outer saying that uh, a, a boycott of taxes is a very dangerous thing, but a boycott of rates can actually get some legal protection. How close is uh, rate boycotts from breaking out in the city of Johannesburg? There's been murmurings. Um, there were even when I was mayor, um, because like I said, the problems that we're seeing now do not start now. It's only that they were compounded by the lack of leadership and the lack of a plan. Um, but there were memories, even when I was mayor. Um, they, they got worse when we were ousted. Um, a lot of people started really saying they, they know, they're going to stop paying their rates because they're having to privatize their own supply of water, electricity. Um, a lot of people now are buying elsewhere and, you know, a lot of people are going off the grid and, and people simply feel there's no point in continuing to contribute. Um, I think it's a dangerous thing. Uh, Johannesburg, being the economic hub of South Africa, will continue to be an asset nationally. Um, and yes, it's unfair to expect Joburg residents to carry the country, but that's the reality is that us who live in Johannesburg, knowing the position of the, the city economically, our contribution to the country's GDP, 
we need to make Joburg work. And, and we are here for various reasons. A lot of us economic migrants ourselves. I grew up in Mavopania. I didn't grow up in Johannesburg. Uh, but we're here, and, and we need to be part of the machinery that makes things work. Um, I believe that we're at a time, particularly ahead of the 2026 election. Look, the 2026 election will offer residents an opportunity to exercise their power with with more knowledge this time. I believe there'll be a huge difference between the mindset of the voter in 2026 and the mindset of the voter in 2021 with all that's happened since 2021. So I am hopeful that in 2026 we will put in place a capable government. Um, I would hate for that government to come into a city that's completely destroyed. Um, I would like us to keep the city going. Um, it's now 2024, so we're talking two years, and it's going to take every single ratepayer to do that. Okay, so if, if you feel that uh, rate boycotts might be a very dangerous thing, because in a way you're going to make a bad situation worse. Mm. We can see you talk about backlogs in maintenance, etc., that's just going to get exacerbated by by um, the idea of a rates boycott. But I, I, I suppose we should have led off with this, is that we've got an ever-shrinking base of rate payers. Mm. Um, and it feels like that's also reaching a point of no return. Well, I wouldn't say a point of no return. For as long as the city is not functional, people will look for alternatives. I'm not just talking about in terms of leaving the city. I'm talking about you don't want to be the only mug paying your rates. You know, you do get to that point where you start saying, you know, um, if three quarters of the city are getting water for free, why should I pay for water? I don't see the rates boycott really playing out. Uh, we've always had revenue collection challenges, and that's why we had to come up with Operation Buyam Teto, and we had to say we'll cut it off if you don't pay, and people would start paying up. So, so there are um, rate-paying delinquents, so to speak, not necessarily because they're on a boycott, but because they're taking advantage of a government that's turning a blind eye on their non-payment, and as soon as we start going after them, then they actually start paying. So I don't think we're at that point yet where people are refusing to pay because they're on a rates boycott. Yes, it is a threat. It remains a threat. Um, I would like to urge residents to give it another two years, vote better in 2026, see if we can't have a capable government that begins to turn around the situation of water supply, electricity supply, and all the other challenges. Um, and, and hopefully we'll never have to get there. Now, um Johannesburg, especially a city as big as Johannesburg, uh, is going to be affected by what happens in the general election. Because some of the major building blocks are going to shift. It's a very real possibility. Yeah. It's a real possibility. Um, you've got your kingmakers, right, if you like the likes of... I hate that word. Well, I hate that. I, I, I what mean, would you I, rather I, we call no, no, it? What, what I, would you rather we I call it? I hate them? the idea that the kingmaker is the small party yeah. and, and the big party is just a donkey being led by the nose. Yeah. But anyway, Unfortunately, it me. is what it is. Yeah. Now, you've got these parties that, that, that hold a lot of leverage, mm. right? And depending on what happens with these parties on the 29th of May and in the subsequent coalition government negotiations at a national and provincial level, we could see some changes at a local level. But given that we're already in 2024 and in two years' time we have an election, realistically, I would say the only change that would give us, or the, the only shift that would give us the change that we need for stable governance and, and to stabilize the city would be an election. And that is why the DA has been pushing for a new election, for fresh elections, because even if there's a shift, because, say, the EFF is disgruntled after the general election, who's to say they won't come back 10 months later after they've made up and shift the dynamics again? So, so what we really need is a more stable coalition of fewer political parties. And, and in my view, that can only happen in 2026 or if we have earlier elections, if the DA succeeds in, 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 in their motion in Johannesburg. Now, if you can uh, try and explain something to me, because we've obviously had Gayton McKenzie uh, on the show and I've asked him. We're due to have Julius Malema soon, so let's hope that happens. Uh, what do you make of this uh, dissonance, I think is the best way to put it, between the leaders of those parties campaigning very virulently about the, the 
the disaster that is the ANC, but then getting into bed with the ANC at, at a local government level. I mean, uh, which one's the lie? You know? Good question. It's a very good question, Mark. So if I am pro good governance, if I am pro service delivery, then yes, I would not want to work with the very party that was responsible for the collapse in the last 30 years. So the question is, what are you really doing in the city? And to my point, it's not about service delivery. It's about lining pockets. It's about making use of this window for as long as it lasts to achieve what you can out of the, the city's coffers before things collapse. Now, uh, talking about uh, lining pockets and uh, doing, um, you know, people basically stealing from, from the city. We've seen, you know, the um, the independent, what are they, not the independent Democrats, the ID, the insp it's investigative directorate, suddenly grow uh, a pair and, and even, you know, threatening as we sit here to uh, arrest the Speaker of Parliament, right, which is like, really, we knew about this five years ago. The, the only surprise is that you're only sort of moving on this now. But let's just say, our, our um, authorities suddenly are able to uh, and do have the political will to do their jobs, which is to arrest people that steal public money. One would imagine that the first place to start is in the cities where the paper trail must be enormous. I mean, we do know that uh, the Speaker of Parliament hid her theft very thinly by calling it wigs and bags and you know, other things, because basically somebody's giving you a bag full of cash. Bag full of cash is kind of hard to, it's, I understand the challenges from a legal perspective there, and I'm no lawyer. But certainly one would imagine that in a city when you've got some extremely dodgy uh, contracts being awarded, that must be like a prosecutor's wet dream, one would imagine, you know, to, to, to go after these officials that are so clearly easy to uh, to to prosecute while i celebrate that the wheels of fighting corruption are starting to turn i still have a concern as the selective nature at the selective nature we'll right? take selective over nothing well, no, ideally not, because if you want this to trickle down to a local level, we can't be selective. We need to be dealing with everything. We've got cases in the city that were investigated by the SIU. Um, investigations that were concluded. Um, you've got the likes of Helen Burtis, the, the, mm. the MD for, for the JPC, the Job of Property Company, till today she holds on to her job. Uh, when we were in office, we, we had actually suspended Helen Burtis. And as soon as the new administration took over, they brought her right back. And, and, and she's got some political protection, it's quite clear. Um, I've heard through the grapevine that, you know, she has protection all the way up to the highest office. And, and so, these are primarily the issues we're dealing with, and uh, you know, and I believe that that the Speaker of Parliament is is a a sacrificial lamb. Is that yes? I believe they, that the ruling party is trying to demonstrate that they're fighting corruption. I don't believe that they're fighting corruption. I believe that they're just using certain cases to to demonstrate that they're fighting corruption. And unfortunately, someone gullible out there will believe it and will still vote for them. Um, I'd like to see them be more intentional and and fight corruption holistically and not not just picking one or two people. Yeah, one must imagine though, certainly in a city like Johannesburg, it must be pretty easy to see. I mean, we had every rent. Um, contract, which was one of the first things that happened when you were asked that your coalition was asked that get re, re, the movement of the of the uh, fiber company, right, to the Department of Roads, yeah. right. Yeah. Now, I mean, that is, yeah, why would you move uh, that if not to do something nefarious? And these things, you know, in, if this was a TV series, you wouldn't need an hour-long episode. You would wrap this up in 30 minutes, one would imagine, you know, if well, you... Well, that, including the collapse of the city's Group Forensic Investigation Services Unit. I mean, from the time I became mayor, there was such an onslaught, you know, to collapse this this unit that was investigating corruption. Uh, you'll recall that General Shadrach Sevilla ended up leaving the city, going back to his SAPS position, 
and subsequent to that, the person that was working closest to him that had all the historical knowledge of all the cases that were in the pipeline was also suspended. Um, I believe she's still sitting at home today, you know, and, and, and you can see that all of this was done just to ensure that people are able to continue to loot without any consequence. And Paul, just uh, explain to me that I, I, I understand you put, you know, people put themselves at risk when they, when they sort of embark on a, on a career in uncovering graft and corruption, because there are some people to whom this is a very, very lucrative business. This being South Africa, one just goes down to the taxi rank and gets it sorted out very cheaply and quickly. Uh, one would imagine that, you know, we've all seen the old mafia movies where eventually even the, the cleanest cop looks the other way. In your experience, are there still people out there who are willing to take up the fight? They got rid of most of them. So you've got a few um, Section 56 managers in the city who have been suspended, who should not have been suspended. One of them was acting city manager when, when, when I was mayor at some point, um, a very a man of integrity, you know, a man who's been in the city for long, substantive ED for for environment and infrastructure services, so which, which, which works very closely with Joburg Water, City Power, Pick It Up. Um, he's, he's been suspended, you know, um, there's, there are people who've been suspended in the legal department, there's, there's someone in HR, also a high-ranking official that's been suspended. I know that they're fighting their suspensions, but that's just the reality, is that anybody that was blocking any nefarious agenda, they got rid of very quickly, and, and that's quite unfortunate. I think I heard something about the ED for development planning also being suspended. I was shocked. I mean, that man was very highly qualified, very good official to work with, was really working very well with us to resolve a lot of historical issues. I believe he was also suspended. I don't know if he's still at home or if he's back, but you can see the pattern. So anybody that's working against um, the plan to loot would, would be victimized. And that's exactly what has happened. My last question to you is that, you know, Johannesburg obviously being this great big city, uh, just, you know, just north of us, we've got uh, the city of Chwane, where, where the DA and its coalition partners do have a, a slim majority, but a majority nonetheless. Kuruleni seems to be uh, in a complete mess. Do you think, you know, as now I want you to be the political analyst, that this will, will manifest in the provincial elections of 2024? In terms of? In terms of, will people, will this affect the way people vote? I see what you Especially mean. Especially when it comes to the provincial election, where if one looks at the votes uh, cast in 2016, the ANC didn't get a, a majority. 2019, they didn't, they only got a, they, they didn't get a majority, but they're able to, co you know, everybody forgets that the current Gauteng government is a coalition. What do, you, what do you think the impact of this is going to be on provincial politics? So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of polls, right, out there. And, and sometimes they differ so much in, in their margins of error. You don't really know which one to go with. But here's the thing, is that while the ANC is failing on the one hand, the opposition needs to demonstrate capacity to take over. They need to demonstrate unity that they can form a stable coalition, particularly with the example of 2021 local government elections. And I think that's what the electorate is looking for. And talking to people on the ground, a lot of people are saying, look, we're tired of the ANC, but we don't know who to vote for. And that to me says that the opposition block has not captured the imagination of the electorate enough to sway the enough votes, a critical enough mass away from the ANC for us to have good enough, um, a better provincial government. Now, we can only hope Right. And, and, and yes, the DA has published some polls that suggest that the ANC is going to fall um, way below 50 percent. And that suggests that the, the opposition will be able to take over the province. I would love to see that happen. I'm not convinced that the electorate is convinced um, that 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 is what needs to happen. Many people will tell you they're tired of the ANC, but they don't know who to vote for. And my biggest fear is that a lot of people will actually stay away. Well, Dr. Mpo Palazzi, it's always a pleasure to speak to you, a voice of reason. I do hope that uh, 
sometime soon we're going to see you back in politics. Boy, we need you at whatever level. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights on the state of the nation. To everybody that's uh, joined us today, please support us by supporting Pace Car Rental, who have been the, sp the sponsors of this episode, and uh, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you again on the State of the Nation. Thank you.